Hello and welcome to Release Date Rewind. My name is Mark J. Parker and I am a film lover, filmmaker, film celebrator. And normally this is an audio podcast wherever you get your podcasts on your favorite apps. But thanks to Portland Media Center, you are about to watch the video component of this show where I celebrate movie anniversaries with my friends. Each month, I usually talk about two different movies that I love with different friends. And we talk about the making of the movies, trivia, any fun memories associated with them. So I hope you enjoy because now it's time to rewind. All right, everybody, she's back on the pod. My good friend, Cece Webster, a Tootsie fanatic, a Tootsie addict i don't know what would you call yourself when it comes to tootsie cc um i'm just a lover i'm a, tootsie, a lover yeah tootsie lover a, a tootsie, tootsie roller <laughs> tootsie roll pop uh i don't know there's something in there there's something yeah there's something that will workshop yeah but it's so nice to see you thank you so much i know things have been crazy you are a very busy lady um holidays also are just busy we were talking a little bit about christmas and all that so you had a good time storm luckily didn't really did did it snow rain with for you guys in new york or no we had a little bit of rain yeah we, we just had really frigid temperatures that affected oh. um up north in new york state as you probably saw there was a lot of problem in buffalo oh but gosh. we're close to the city we're close to the river um we really i think we were kind of in a tiny part of the country that just didn't really get bothered too good. much by it all um so yeah, it was good. It was a good holiday. I'm excited to talk Tootsie and um, and also just to kind of go down memory lane in hearing about, you know, this time period. Yes. And our kind of film history. So 40, 40 years ago, 82. And it's so funny because so Cece and I were saying offline, I remembered like in the back of my mind, like, oh, yeah, I think Cece likes Tootsie. Mm -hmm. But I forgot that not only do you like it, you've taught this movie. You yeah. you know this movie. How many times do you think you've seen Tootsie in your life? Well, you know, you say that and now I feel like I'm going to forget everything I know about it. <laughs> That's um, all right. That's how it goes. I, I, you know, I honestly, it's funny. I have taught this film. Um, I didn't see it too early in my my youth okay. it wasn't really until college that um and that was in the 90s that it kind of came to me oh, and, and then because i was so uh you know artsy and moody and you know thought i was so cool and i was learning about film really for the first time i was like oh tootsie you know what is tootsie gonna give me meanwhile you know my professors are you know showing all these great things about oh the yeah of, of of tootsie as a story but it wasn't until I was in graduate school at Columbia and I was TAing for Andrew Saris um, in his American Film History 1960, 1990 class that he showed this film that was on his syllabus. Um, and having to kind of see it through the, you know, co-ed's eyes, the, you know, kids, the college kids' eyes, even though I was only a little bit older than them. And right. thinking about, um, you know, the shape and the nature of how the story is told and just like the comedic timing and also just that point, this is the you know early 2000s, um, the nostalgia I had for actors like, you know, Dabney Coleman and Terry Garr and even oh, seeing yeah. those familiar faces like Estelle Getty and Christine Ebersole and right. just these people that were just part of my life. Um, I found a new love for it in a way that I was uh, kind of overwhelmed by and um, and then since then, it's just been like every time I see it, every time it's on, every time it was on a pay channel or something, it's like, I gotta, gotta listen to that silly song go oh to my. The <laughs> and the montage. And I've got to like watch Michael Dorsey get through all this. And um, there's really just not an, a part of it that for me is dull. It just, no, I completely agree. Really vibrant. So I just, yeah. yeah, I just love it. I really wow. do. Wow. Oh, I love that so much. That's so interesting. I figured because you love it so much, I just figured you saw it as a kid, you know, maybe on VHS or something. But no, you saw it a little later. I love that. Well, I admit, this is my first time I'm finally watching the full thing, like from start to finish. Yeah. I don't know what took me so long. I think, you know, I, I've always known about it. I've seen the musical. I saw the stage musical was on when it was Before on Broadway. You saw yeah. The movie yeah. Yes. Isn't wow, that funny? Fascinating. That's yeah. Awesome. I had always, of course, you, everyone kind of knows the story, right? It doesn't take long to at least know the gist, right? Yeah. And so I saw the show, 
with my friend Monica years ago before it closed. I know it kind of it didn't come and go. It, it won some Tonys, I remember. It was pretty popular. but um, And I love the musical, but the movie is better, as you know they usually are. And wow, I'm so happy I finally checked out the full movie. I had seen a clip or two, but it's good. It yeah. made me... I, I kept... Because I was like folding boxes, candle boxes for Greg, for the candles. So I'm like putting stickers on things. That's usually what I do when I'm like... Yeah like re-watching movies you know for this show and oh my god i was so delayed on the boxes greg's like do you have them for me i'm like oh my god i'm watching tootsie that's so good you know <laughs> it was so, yeah and like, you know it, and it is surprising how it's holding up because obviously in terms of gender politics and our you know current climate there's a lot of stuff in there there's totally. sexism there's all kinds of odd stuff but what's i think at the core of it all is that similar to something like some like it hot or yeah. even a movie i love which i know you're gonna laugh a lot about she's the man oh i, think, I love she's the man oh one she's of the best oh. but there's this thing that happens with mistaken identity i'm not gonna talk oh. about the like gender side of it too much but just mistaken identity that for me um i'm a total sucker for uh -huh. it i enjoy it i think it's super funny but i think they that's what i think out at the end of the day you know sydney pollock is having fun as a director with the idea of, you know, the predicament of the the secret and yes. how you deal with that secret and all the funny things that you can do that kind of surround that. Let me tell you about my client, Michael Dorsey. He was a fine actor, maybe a great actor, but for every role he wanted, there was a reason why he wasn't right. Sorry, you're too tall. I can be shorter. No, I can't use you. Too short. Oh, I can be taller. Too moody. Next. Too old. Too stubborn. You're too much trouble. Too tough. Too temperamental. Too pushy. Too difficult. Michael, no one will hire you. Just watch me. Yeah, I think you're so right. I think it's like a laugh. It's pretty much a laugh every few minutes. Um, there are tons oh, yeah. of underhanded jokes that don't even seem like jokes that are, yep. uh, when you rewatch it again, you're like, oh my God, you know, I, I forget there's that one joke that they're talking about, like how close to get on the camera or how far, and he oh. goes, how far back should I go? And he's like, Cleveland, you know, <laughs> yes. um, because, you know, she doesn't look that beautiful right. um, on camera. And <laughs> those kind of things were just like, that to me is the timeless, they're timeless oh, jokes. Yeah. I'd like to make her look a little more attractive. How far can you pull back? How do you feel about Cleveland? Great just, script. Yeah, super, super smart writing. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think you're right. I think that it's, um, you can't help, there's definitely music, the David Gruss music, and also, of course, the the songs written for the movie are right. kind of outrageously ridiculous. They right? are ridiculous. Although, you know, I have to say, I, I quite like the song during the montage when we have close-ups of the beautiful yeah. nails and the eyes you know go tootsie go um even though i know it's very simple i love that the song that actually got all the popularity and the yeah. oscar nom which one that that's called why can't i not remember it now it's, oh i it's, have it i have it written down for myself because oh it might be you Some it might be you See, I, it might be you that one right? yes yes and i i could i couldn't even remember the title because it's a little sleepy i don't know it's the 80s like i wanted something a little fun but I, you know, I guess I understand yeah. like, okay, that's the more serious song, but I'm like, no, go Tootsie Go. That's my song. I would love to know. There's probably a podcast out there and hey folks, if you know of it, let me know. But I feel like, you know, Arthur the movie and of course, Christopher Cross wrote Arthur's theme, which, you know, is a classic, a, a movie that doesn't necessarily deserve a ballad. It's a mm. comedy that has this ballad. And I wonder if there was just this thing happening in Hollywood where, mm there was a success radio success with these songs and like this um i think it's stephen bishop is the guy behind go tootsie go and oh uh, yes um, it might be you and i mm -hmm. feel like they're going for like the radio edit mm -hmm. like ways to you know again maybe also get an oscar nom or win an mm -hmm. oscar and be mm -hmm. on the radio um because i feel like you're so right that the tone, the feel of that song. I mean, I, although I understand there is love happening is so absolutely treacly. Like it's so saccharine. It's so, yeah. it's so it's kind lonely. of like, like you said, this movie, and I completely agree. It might be 40 year old, 40 years old, everybody, but it, it, it pops. I mean, yeah. before Dustin becomes 
uh, before Michael becomes Tootsie Dorothy, right? Um, it's It pops and then it pops even more. And so it's very lively. And so the song, the theme song is not that lively. And no. also for me, and we'll get into it, I'm sure when we, you know, break it down more, but like the romance is like, lower on my list of mm -hmm. storylines. I don't know. I look at it like when I was watching, I was like, oh, I care more about Terry Gar than I do Jessica Lang. I 100%. care more about like the, just the just acting. And I think that's what I really appreciate about this movie. It's a movie about just hustling and like mm -hmm. trying to, you know, perfect your craft and book the gig, you know, and then the other kind of crazy stuff happens just once you book the gig, you know. I have so, to yeah. tell you, I am so with you, as you probably know from my little tiny video I made um, mm -hmm. that when Gotham Writers Workshop asked me to highlight a fave um, for their social media at the beginning of the pandemic. Terry Garr is one of my favorite actors of this time period in general. Yeah. And not only do I love her, but I also am with you that I love the underdog of her character and of what she's kind of working toward and her funny relationship, lack of relationship with um, you know, Michael Dustin Hoffman's yes. character and she is so endearing. And so she feels so real and well-rounded to me where mm -hmm. Jessica Lange's character too. Um, I learned a little bit. I, I was able to listen to this great podcast. I guess it's um, mm -hmm. Phil Rosenthal and I'm forgetting the other writer that he does a podcast with called Naked Lunch. They oh. had Elaine May on and she's mm. never really talked very much about anything and she's never been on a podcast. So of course I had to listen. Oh yeah. And, she said that Jessica Lange was someone that Sidney Pollack really wanted to be in the movie. They really hadn't written a character that or you know, that would work for her. Mm. And she wrote the like scene where they're in the bed at the farm. And oh. that's what Jessica auditioned with. Oh, and okay. of course, like they loved her. And that's also why there's this kind of odd, like Southern kind of bent going mm -hmm. on. Because she's naturally a Southern woman, Jessica Lange, and has that about her that because mm -hmm. you know you think about like where is this farm they're going to like i live in westchester county which is right. essentially where they're going and there are some farms there's many farms in westchester dutchess county yeah. also county north of me but it's almost like they're going to like the south yeah do you know what i mean <laughs> yeah like how long was this drive guys like <laughs> and then charles derning being dad who i love so oh much yeah after. i love He's him cool. so yeah. much but he's like not the same like it's almost like it's a, a fictitious fantasy farmland. Um, yeah. They kind of build for the Jessica Lang character, and the song is the same thing. It's like this right. fantasy thing yes. um, that's going on. And I agree with you. It is to me like the oddest dream. Feels like a fantasy dream sequence. The whole farm thing um, <laughs> of the whole movie. I, I love it. I mean, great, great comedy and some great, um, you know, serious kind of. Uh, stuff there a little bit you know dad says to dorothy you know once um yeah. why can't i i can't remember just Lang's character's name is it's julie it's julie it's right julie? Okay. yes I'm, yeah i don't remember either you know julie goes to bed she says be good be good and i wrote in my notes gulp because dorothy <laughs> dorothy is looking like oh god i you know because that's and that's so interesting because i knew I saw, you know, in the long list of writers, it's really only a few are credited, but I know there are some uncredited writers like Elaine yeah. May. Yeah. And I know she she worked on the Birdcage script, so she knows she knows some great like kind of cross-dressing stuff, which is I mean, she is so funny. But um yeah, that that whole farm thing is is you're right, it's so idyllic that it's dreamlike, but then a lot of the really memorable stuff for me of yeah. like oh shit, like we have a problem like dad girl you know in bed with me like really good stuff there like what is michael yeah. gonna do you know yeah, he's, oh. really, he's really putting into a, a serious predicament there yeah. and i mean i just think too though if like with, if you had different actors in a different time period the the um ability for it to kind of get maudlin mm. with the piano playing and the missing of mom right and the kind of the little details like that that i feel like you know, we, we don't do, we're not as, I think a lot of films, modern films aren't as messy in some mm -hmm. ways. They don't, they don't kind of push it a little bit. They, they, if they haven't set it up super clearly, they're worried that they can't have a moment like that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the kind of moment that for me makes the comedy even funnier is yeah. that you have these real human moments of, you know, like you, you're talking about too, of, you know, be good and, 
you know, the, the piano and the kind of um, sorrow. And then you have this like ridiculous comedic side to it that just, yeah. I think it hits harder for me. So once Julie goes to bed, that's when we kind of touch on some interesting, you know, because I think actually this movie has aged pretty well. I was most curious to see like, okay, let's see how, like <laughs> what homophobic, transphobic jokes are there. I didn't, you know, I didn't think it was that bad, actually, for uh, being a 40-year-old movie. There were only a couple times, and it's more, it's mostly with Charles Durning's character, in my yeah. perspective. He's, but we sort of, it, it kind of makes sense, because by the end, uh, I know we're kind of jumping around, but by the end, I mean, he feels duped. He's like, yeah. totally, he feels totally tricked. His daughter feels totally tricked. So I could understand why he sort of says something at the end, like, you know, do you even like girls or, st you know, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. But it's in that scene where Julie leaves him alone and he talks about like, uh, roosters don't try to lay eggs. He mm -hmm. says, not all men are equal. You know, there's some really interesting kind of men versus women stuff yeah. that is still kind of rings true today. Right. I agree. I, I think that I do. I, I feel that um, it might just be also that um, someone who is not necessarily, you know, um, have, has struggled with my gender identity. I don't know exactly how some of the jokes would ring for some other folks, but I'm with you too, that I, I actually think that it's not, um, it doesn't seem to be pointing fingers at or um, being really cruel about identity as much as it is just kind of talking about Mm -hmm. men versus women as a kind of whole like the yeah. you know uh, the details it's interesting though because in this elaine may interview she talks about you know the um and i'm going to go into the origin here for one second on mm -hmm. kind of how the script came to be if that's all right yes so, please this was dustin hoffman's project from the beginning like he mm knew of this play, he wanted this to happen. He had Robert Evans help him get the rights, Robert Evans being very famous film producer at the time, you know, produced The Godfather amongst other big mm -hmm. movies. Um, and, you know, it was his baby. It was Dustin Hoffman was gonna make this movie and he was gonna figure out how to do it. And that's also why there was so many different writers is because it didn't come from an origin story of a writer. It came from a play that then needed a screenwriter and there's lots of different screenwriters. But Elaine May in this podcast is talking about how when she came in after there was a bunch of already adaptation happening with the play and everything, the kind of main thrust of the jokes were about this idea of him pretending to be gay and wow. be kind of in drag and going to bars like that and, and the joke of like not being gay but being in drag and then also a lot of this kind of joking about like men in women's bathrooms and like the whole that whole thing of you know and she basically was like by the way guys none of that's funny mm. none of that's gonna be funny and um in this meeting she was having with uh, Sydney Pollack and I think a few of the other writers in comes Dustin Hoffman at that exact moment and he goes you know what Sydney I don't like this dress I think it makes me look fat I don't like how it works around me. I think I think Dorothy is prettier than this. Mm. Um, and, and it like was like a bell for her in her brain. And she goes, this is the movie. This yeah. is what's funny. Is this idea of how much he cares about his craft. Like, and that is very yes. Dustin. He's very yes. much a guy that um, that's what he's worried about. He's not worried about the gender politics or, I mean, right. it, it sucks that he has to kiss, you know, the head of the... <laughs> The the creepy doctor <laughs> actor. Oh my gosh! Right? Oh. But but that's not you know what he's worried about is you know the respect to this character that he's playing and the love he has for her as a strong yeah. woman. And um, so it's interesting to think about you know they were leading to a place that I think would have been a lot more yeah um, problematic, uh -huh. and they ended up in a place that I think is a lot more universal and playing more with that idea of switch identity versus only male v woman yes what about this thing i hate the way the horizontal lines make me look too hippie and and, and it cuts me across the bus it's ultimately about an actor who is just mm -hmm. so desperate hungry and also committed yes. and that's oh, when it gets funny he's yes. so committed and it's a bit meta because you're right it's very dustin hoffman you know so yeah that's when it's so funny is that he wants a gig so badly he gets it which we'll have to talk about the whole Terry Gar situation because yes, he's breaking so... her heart all the time, but I we'll know. get there. But you know, yeah, he gets it. And now how is he going to do a good job and 
totally be Dorothy, you know? So yeah, that's so much funnier than any sort of like, uh, yeah. Yeah. And stuff and gay like, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Going into gay bars and having all these different scenes and, and playing around with the kind of, which in the eighties, we know there was a lot of really mm -hmm. awful kind of um, like gay for play jokes. You know, there was just right. a consistent, uh, you know, I mean, how many different movies do you watch now? And you're like, oh, like, why are they making fun of that particular character that way? It, it seems right. really awful. Plus, um, this came out, you know, Reagan was president, AIDS, yeah. the AIDS crisis yeah. was happening. So they could have really, I guess that's also why I was surprised. They could have really been more fearful of of just yeah. men and drag and all this stuff. They could have been way more, you know, front loaded with it. Yeah, I think that. You know, I, I would feel comfortable um, showing this to an eight year old mm -hmm. um, and having the chat about some of the funny things and, you know, some of the identity stuff. Um, but I wouldn't think it would, you know, put any kind of nastiness in the minds of, you right. know, kids who might watch it or anything like that. Um, yeah. I do think there are probably folks out there that um, would, would not want to watch it and would find it still offensive, but um, I think that the intention behind it was was not to point and make fingers. And I think, yeah. in fact, I think Dorothy comes out to be the best character of them all. Um, mm -hmm. She's she's a better person than Michael, mm -hmm. um, like we're talking about in terms of how he relates to his world around him. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, she's a better worker. She's a better communicator. She's... <laughs> She's an icon. I like know. He, he I creates mean, an icon. And what's the famous yeah. line he says at the end to Jessica? I was yeah. a better man when yeah. I was a woman with you. Yeah. Something like that, right? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, Dorothy is like amazing, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's even more amazing that she's not a beautiful woman. You know, she can't be. That's like not possible with Dustin's, you know, face and body and all that. But yeah, like she's someone everyone, well, mostly everyone roots for. I know Dabney mm -hmm. Coleman like gets sick of her, the director of the, yeah. of the what is it, Southwest <laughs> General, you know. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, and it's funny because I always wondered what's with the poster? Why is she in front of the flag? But she kind of does sort of become like, mm -hmm. you know, like I love seeing the, the fans crowd around her as, as she gets more and more famous on this show, right? Yeah. Well, I also, I think it's, it's interesting that as a woman watching this, a younger woman, when I first saw it in full, um, I was inspired by the idea that standing up for yourself and right. being bold and uh, speaking your mind, um, it was fun to see that succeed um, for a woman character. It's kind of a, it's kind of awful to think that it needs to be a man dressed up like that to have the the gumption to just do right. what they're going to do and, and have that male privilege or whatever you want to call it. That's true. But as, but as a young woman, I know that it's technically a actor, male actor in drag mm -hmm. performing, but I took a lot of like inspiration from the kind of Dorothy character. And I got such a kick out of the strength of that character and, you know, getting back at those Dabney Coleman types. Yeah. I mean, for me, it was like, I had the same kind of fun I have when I watch nine to five, speaking mm -hmm. of that woman, yep. with women, women pushing the boundaries, watching um, a man kind of realize how hard it is for women and also mm -hmm. pushing boundaries. Um, so I might be, I might be, uh, you know, incorrect in that feeling, but I did have inspiration from it. And yeah. I still do when I watch, I still get inspired by the idea of, you know, um, you know, not holding back. Yeah. When, when you have an idea of not letting something go forward that you think is not a good, not something good. Because, you know, here's the thing. Michael, I know Michael's not a likable character, but it's not that he's unlikable. He has a lot of fun qualities. He's just, yeah, you know, he's a bit of a womanizer. We see him kind of, you know, treat yes. Terry Gard not so well at all. Right. Yeah. And different women. He's just, he gets distracted, you know, Christine Ebersole and everything. But he really does learn about women which makes us like him that he he does take women seriously it's it's just that his his love interest with Jessica Lang um gets a little complicated for me where i almost wonder what would the movie have been like if there wasn't really a love interest he just ended up really yeah supporting her and fighting for her you know mm -hmm. from the network and you know what i mean like 
that's I just wonder what a version would be where there isn't really as much romance, you know. I love that idea. I would absolutely love if that was if there was a remake of this story, maybe not the musical, but another movie where it's just about having a friendship, finding Mm. a real friendship with a woman. And I think there could still definitely be the, um, you know, betrayal of that the same way it is now in the story. But instead of it having to be romantic, it's just, I thought I could trust you. Mm -hmm. I thought you were my really close friend and I had made a new really close friend who understood how I was feeling as a single mom and how yeah. it is to be in this relationship. And um, I think that's such a great idea. And I feel like that would, it would, it would help me a lot with that particular storyline. Like you is my least, mm. I think Jessica Lange is such a great actor. So I'll just like watch her do anything. I genuinely right. love watching her. I love sitting, seeing her like hang out in her fancy apartment. I know. Right. Like, glass yeah. of, like white wine. I'm like, I'm riveted just watching yeah. her like stir a pot, but <laughs> Um, <laughs> at the same time, I think you're so on to something there because that's where the, I get blurred. But boy, did he show us. He auditioned for the female lead on a soap opera and became the hottest new actress in America. And you know what? No one knows his new identity, not even the girl he's madly in love with. Soon everyone will know that she's Dustin Hoffman and he's Tootsie. But yeah, I I kind of viewed it at the end when they're walking away together where she does warm up to him again. She's giving him another shot. I kind of just viewed it as like, all right, well, they're going to be friends for a while before they try to, you know, be romantic. Because that's like real realistic to me is like they're going to just walk off and they're just like buddies, you know. Yeah. And they're going to like yeah. support each yes. other. Yes. And, um, you know, I, I you're right, though. I think you're right about. Uh, the studio system at the time and Hollywood Mm -hmm. in general is that like you really couldn't get away without there being kind of a romance situation happening, but how great would it be? You know, we're modernizing the story here a little bit, but that they become really close friends. And maybe also the Sandy character, our Terry Gar character is, you know, looped in in some way, you know, um, and becomes like, they end up being, you know, a couple at the end because he realizes what he's been doing. Um, and what it's like, right. um, and that yes. you know, she is fantastic, and he's been ignoring her, you know, and all that stuff. And I, I feel like it could be a, Love it. Know, right? It could be really fantastic because that that is also the other. I don't have so much of a problem of him being tough on Terry Gar. That I've read a few articles where people are like, "Oh, he's such a jerk that he's when he's like, you know, coaching her at the beginning, and he goes, stop being oh. a doormat, right? Oh, no, I love I love that. I feel like yeah. that's acting class. That's yeah. he's just being a good coach. Yeah. I don't yeah. I don't think there was any exactly. bullying or that's how know. I thought about it, too. And obviously, the the romantic side of it. Um, she's so absolutely someone you care about, like, naturally, I think, as an actor that Oh, yeah, almost like, like, um, if it was a different actor, we might not feel the same way where we're just like, we're so, our heart goes out to her so much oh, when yeah. she's waiting at that dinner and like has, you know, like by the phone. The two things I would love, um, because I really do think there's so much about it that for me, like hits on all cylinders mm-hmm. that I would love uh, there to be some redemption for Terry Gar's character I and, agree. you know, a little bit less heavy on the romance the big great scene where she says i'm responsible for my own orgasm right yeah and and she's she's found out that michael you know is in love with someone else and all that and her heart's broken you know she's professional right she's not gonna let this little love triangle get in the way she's still gonna do the play right because again it's all about actors it's all about acting this is you know they're crazy people (laughs) right i'm in love with another woman Thanks so much for watching. Next week will be part two of this discussion. And in the meantime, please follow Release Date Rewind on Instagram.